So tonight we're looking at Search for Truth, or the title is Search for Truth. Sorry about my messy writing. Search for Truth. And it's funny how, when you're about to give a talk like this, so it's on your mind a lot, that you can just be in normal conversation, everyday conversation, in this case with one of my children, not one of my children who are here tonight, the younger one, and, and that gets you reflecting on what you're going to talk. So this morning it was on the way to school, our youngest said, this other family we know, do they believe the same thing we do? And it catches me, that sort of thing, because I think, well, I said, yeah, they do. Um, but then I thought, here's this little child sitting next to me and must be very aware that they belong to this group that's an increasingly shrinking group, it seems, within our society. It's not in other countries, it's a growing number of people there would say that they believe what we believe, but in our society, it is becoming more and more part of a group that are like the people who saw the UFO. Mm -hmm. And so as, as I was uh, dropping him off, I just thought it unsettled me a little bit because I think, what am I asking him to believe as my child? What have I introduced to him? Am I asking him to believe the truth or am I asking him to believe something else? And so then as I came to college, uh, or went off to actually work on the talk, I thought I'd frame tonight's talk in a sense a, as a stepping through the process that I use when I think through um, why I believe what I do and particularly why I believe it's reasonable for me to trust in the truth claims of the Bible. So you'll notice that the subheading was what does the Bible have to say? So, I guess what, what I'd say, there, there are two kinds of people here tonight. There are those people who are, of, who are of Christian faith, and I would say by stepping you through this process that I go through when I am sort of perturbed or disturbed by things that I hear, or when I think, wow, I'm the only person around here who believes this, is it still reasonable for me to regard the Bible as having something to say about the truth about this world? So I'd be thinking if you're a person here who's of Christian faith, that I'm hoping that I'll help you build a foundation that may help you explain it to others or to even feel better within yourself and more comfortable in your own skin. If you're a person who is not of Christian faith, and there are people like that here tonight, it's good that you're here because in a sense you're like the jury who smells a rat. So we want you to be sitting there thinking, because we don't want to, no one, no one is happy with special pleading. So it's good, and I would hope you'd call me out on that, because I would hope that what I'm about to do is something that I would feel comfortable saying back at the science faculty at QUT, and they would say, no, this is logical, this is consistent. Um, they may not come with me to where I go, but they won't say that this is, you know, you just tell them it's fairy tales. So that's what I would hope that I'm doing here tonight. And I want to cover it in three Part. So when we talk about search for truth, we get rid of this one. Search for truth, I'm first going to argue, one, that it extends beyond... Can you actually... Is there any point in me writing this? Because you don't... <laughs> <laughs> extends beyond the use... There's this thing called PowerPoint. ...of the <laughs> scientific... I hate PowerPoint. Scientific method tonight. <laughs> so the first thing that is, search for truth, I'm going to argue, extends beyond the use of the scientific, the scientific, the scientific method. Second, um, the use of the Bible to speak about truth is based, and you may be disappointed that I'm about to say this, but wait till we get to it, because I think you'll feel a little more satisfied when I get there. The use of the Bible is based on faith. That is, the use of the Bible to access truth is actually something that's based on faith. Um, but we'll talk about that. And then finally, the search for truth, or ser your search for truth, when using the... If we're going to talk about what does the Bible have to say, its truth claims are accessed by wrestling with the humanity of the Bible. Now, 
Now, you may think that's odd. There may be two people, kinds of people here. There are those who <coughs> think that's funny to think about the humanity of the Bible because you may be used to hearing it as, as God's word. There are others who think, well, of course, it's just another human book. Um, because if I just pick up one thing, I've got a couple of props here, actually. This is called the Leningrad Codex, so it's over a thousand years old. In fact, simile of the oldest full uh, manuscript of the Bible, and you can see what it's like there. It's a whole, you can come and have a look later. This thing was written by people who rode donkeys for transport, and we're going to be talking about it's something that makes truth claims that should be trusted. So how can that be? But it's obviously a very human document when you just look at it like that. So three things that we're going to talk about, and I'm going to rub these two off now and deal with them as we go. I won't be writing much on the whiteboard until we get to the end of three, because I want to use Genesis 1 as an example of this, what we're talking about as wrestling with the humanity of Scripture or the Bible. So the first thing is that the search for truth, I want to argue that it's reasonable to expect that that search must extend beyond the use of the scientific method. So if I were to bring out tonight a, uh, a textbook that's a science or a chemistry textbook for first year uni students, I said, can you trust its truth claims? Most of us would say, I'd say everybody would say, well, yeah, of course you can. They've used the scientific method. We're great, we, you know, we have this great certainty that generally what it's saying, of course there are occasionally updates, but it's basic science is Correct. We're pretty confident in the claims that it makes about the sort of questions that it's addressing. But if I pull out Leningrad Codex and say, can you trust this document written by people uh, who didn't wear shoes and rode donkeys? Um, then, well, they probably did wear shoes actually, it was just a rhetorical flourish. <laughs> but I'm just trying to really pan them at the moment and say, well, do we have confidence that this could be true? Could we regard this as true? And I think most of us would say we're a little bit less certain about that one. Um, we like the idea of science. We like the idea of certainty. So when I said before that ultimately when we turn to the Bible and trust that it makes truth claims, it's based on faith. We sort of wish that it was based on scientific claims. And as I said, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But actually, I want us to think about the search for truth beyond science using an analogy to do with agriculture. So you heard before I worked in ruminants, which for stomach animals is the very more elegant sort of answer to the question that Paul raised. But think about it this way. If we went back a good thousand years here and we were all part of a community, we'd be, what sort of community? We'd be hunters and gatherers. So I don't, know, I, I don't think this is a myth. I think it is that the men would have gone out, feeling a bit hungry, and ended up going a long way away, chasing a kangaroo, trying to spear the thing. That's what they found that day. On another day, they found a wombat. It may have been a bit easier, a bit of digging, but they got it. The women have sort of fanned out around the countryside a bit closer, and who knows what they're going to bring back, right? There's a great diversity. It's always surprising what's brought. Look, today they brought back five koalas. Well, that was a surprise. Um, Tomorrow, it's a kangaroo, uh, a platypus maybe. And then the women are bringing back some sort of berry or digging up a yam. So there's great diversity or variety in the food source, but you can never be certain exactly what they're going to bring back. And then one day, the tribal elder says, do you know what? We're never so clear on what sort of food we're going to get. We need some confidence. This is how we're going to go about it. We're going to reduce the diversity of what we eat. We've got these potatoes, we've got some corn, we've got a goat and some beans. And what we're going to do is we're going to clear this little area along the river here because there's some water there. And then that's all we're going to grow, those four things. We're committing to them. We know when you've got to plant them. And we can be pretty confident now that we're always going to have food. It's going to take up a lot of our time just to make sure that's right. We don't have time to fan across the country anymore. But, but that's what we're going to eat, those four things, with great confidence, knowing that we're planning ahead that there's going to be that food. That's, a, that's the agricultural method. And you can, see what's, you can see what the game is. There's confidence knowing you're going to get a food source. But you can see what you lose when you use that, which is essentially a scientific method, is variety or diversity. 
you know you're only going to get goats, beans, potatoes and corn. That's it. You've got to slug that every day. Unless, because this is the important thing, you jump the fence of the farm and then you run off into the bush and all those other foods are still there, right? You've just got to use other methods. But you still lack the confidence or certainty that you will find a berry or that particular berry. You may just find a yam. But you'll find some kind of food. It's just that you're going to use other methods and that one that gives you great confidence. Do you see what I'm saying here? So the same thing happens in our search for truth in our daily lives. So the scientific method comes along and says, here's your chemistry textbook. What we're going to do is we've got this method where we measure things in time and space, you know, time-space continuum, and we can give you great confidence in the answers that we get to certain questions, so long as we narrow the range of questions. How did we evolve? Or, you know, what is the height of that mountain? We can answer these sort of things with great confidence in, in the answers that we come up with, but we've reduced the diversity or variety of questions that we, we can answer. But we know in our everyday lives, we always jump the fence of the scientific method to go and answer other questions. Does she love me? Does he love me? These sort of things. I, one day maybe scientists will come up with, I don't know, some sort of thing you put on the ground if she walks over it, if it turns a certain colour, they've figured out there's some hormone going on that thinks she likes me. I'm pretty certain. But for the moment, we get along with using other methods of discernment of what the truth is about how she feels about me, how he feels about me. Um, you know, we, we use that all the time. You could say the current plebiscite, this survey of what our nation thinks about marriage, is our own government asks us to discern the truth of what is right and good without using a laboratory. It's that we're just, everyone's probably using all sorts of different methods to come up with what do we think about that? I was thinking about this with the Macklemore song, Same Love. Some of you probably know the, the Macklemore, Same Love, that nearly didn't get into the NRL grand final because the assumption is it's making truth claims and it may persuade some people to vote no rather than yes. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make a comment either way here. What I'm saying is when Macklemore has a line in that, um, I can't change even if I wanted to, I can't change even if I tried, Macklemore has come to a conclusion about what's right and true about what's possible for a person who's same-sex attracted without seems using science. So all I'm saying is here is we do this all the time. We're always trying to discern truth without using the scientific method. And this must apply to religious texts. So I'm not even narrowing down on the Bible at this point. So my argument at this point is just saying the search for truth will extend and does extend every day beyond using science to address all sorts of questions that science can't answer. And this is what we're saying about music that we listen to, popular music, alternative music, uh, the Hunger Games. I mean, look at the capital and all the districts. What is it saying about political systems? It's making a truth claim about what that author is saying, something about what's right and what's wrong about that political system. And it's also true about religious texts. So I'd be hoping at this point, most people are going to follow me on this, but I think it's one point that we can contribute something to our society is that we have got to a point where it's a lazy society, or maybe not lazy, it's, it's just gone after the certain, it's, it's gone after the potatoes, corn, beans and goats. And say so that's all we need. Whereas there are far more delicious ways of understanding the truth about our world. And I'm going to say that one of those things is the religious, you know, is a religious text. That brings me to the second point. We, we can wait for questions till the end if you like. If something's really getting to you, you can just call it out. The second point in the search for truth is that our interest, or hang on, trust in the truth claims of the Bible <coughs> is based on faith. So 
we've got to say, why are we privileged as Christians? So why are we privileging the truth claims of the Bible now, of one religious text, over all other religious texts? Why do we privilege the truth claims of the Bible over Macklemore or, or Katy Perry or um, whatever other literature we want to mention? And I think this is an important point, is that it's based on... Why well, have I got wide at the corners of my mouth? I feel like it. But, um, <laughs> I think we would like it at this point of the talk if we could say, well, well, why do we privilege the Bible as a source of truth that can be trusted? We would like it if so, if my area is Hebrew, if I came along and said, well, I can point to about 270 examples across the Bible of supernatural knowledge that couldn't have been said unless that information came from out of space or out of this world. You know, we would like that because somehow that would give us the evidence to say, well, it has to be trustworthy. But that's, in fact, not how we come to the Bible as, uh, as a source of truth. We come to the Bible uh, as Christians and expecting to find it making reliable truth claims on the basis of faith. Someone says to us, hey, uh, Jesus was God's son, fully God, fully human. He died for us and he was raised back to life for us as a guarantee that you could be raised back to life as well. And you say, well, that makes a bit of sense of, one, the fact that I can sometimes feel guilty. Two, it makes sense and satisfies my longing for eternal life, a bit disappointed that I'm mortal and going to die. Um, and actually, it, 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 it sounds like it brings joy and makes life feel a little more fulfilling, as though I can now know where I've come from, where I'm going. And so, all of a sudden, you, you believe. And they say, and you see this Bible? This is God's Word, right? So this is, this is where He speaks. So that when I finally walk over to this big old text and look at it, it's only after someone has said to me, hey, Jesus died for you and he was raised back to life, it's only then that they say, see that book over there? That's the word of God. You'll, you'll find the word. Of, it contains the word of God. So that when I walk over, you see, that's important because now I walk over and open it and I am expecting now to find truth claims there that are reliable and, and trustworthy. Now, the significance of this is because Perhaps you're sitting there thinking, so what? The significance would be, because you might say at that point, if you're standing in level five at the, the at P block at QUT with these scientists, you're giving this talk, they say, all right, I'm tapping out of this now because you've just said that you regard this book as making reliable truth claims because, or on the basis of faith in a guy who died and was resurrected. But my response would be to say, I'm still being consistent because anyone who believes, well, here I've just said it, you, you believe in the scientific method. So if you say, why does someone follow the scientific method? Why does someone practice science? Ultimately, it's on the basis of faith. Because you could think of a scientific missionary who, uh, who goes to a to a, another country that for some reason has had no exposure to the scientific method. They turn up and they say, right, do you know you can make measurements in time and space, double blind experiments, all these sort of things, and we're going to, we're going to be able to say things with great certainty about your environment here. And, and actually, you cannot turn around back to that, that claim and test it with the very tools they said you could use. So if they say, well, you just measure things, so, okay, how do I apply those measurements to just test whether your claim is true? Do you see what I mean? You can't, you can't do that. So what you've got to do is, the scientific missionary says, here you go, this works, I can tell you on the other side of the world they're doing this, and they love it. And so then you set up a lab and you try it and it confirms what he told you, right? Or she told you, being politically correct. Um, always. Antenna is always up for it. Um, but it, it's a, uh, it was proclaimed, the scientific method. You believe it, thought, 
resonates as true, I'll try it, and now it confirms your faith in it. And so it's consistent that when we say, okay, the Bible is this book that contains, or a text that contains God's word, someone, you know, it's consistent to say, I've come to that belief on the basis of the gospel, that I believed it, and now in living it confirms for me that it was true, and so I've got this book as part of my life now that I trust contains the word of God, that it's, that it's true. Now, this is very important. It's very important, particularly for people sitting here who sometimes, I would say, may have a brittle understanding of the Bible. And by brittle, I mean you may come to the text of the Bible and someone says, I don't know, well, we're going to look at Genesis 1. Someone says, do you know what? We evolved. We've got apes as ancestors. And all of a sudden you think, that's the end of the Bible for me. That's the end of my faith. Or someone says, do you know that book uh, of the New Testament? It says it was written by so-and-so, but some people think it was written by somebody else. You think, that's it. It's all over for me. I've got to chuck the thing out in my faith as well. But someone says, you know, chapter 21 of John, someone says it was inserted at a late time. I don't even know if that's true. But I'm just thinking of things that may be thrown up for us in life as we're exposed to the study of the Bible that we find very troubling and threaten to undermine our belief that actually we could find truth here, that it contains truth. The important thing about this point is if we come to the Bible on the basis of faith in the gospel, we have what's called a providential view of scripture. So it's, that's a big word, but it's essentially it's essentially saying, by the time I go and pick up that book after someone says, hey, Jesus died, he was raised back to life for you, you've got eternal life. And then this is this is where you find God's word. Like by the time I go and pick it up, my assumption is it is the book God wanted me to have. It's a providential view of Scripture. So someone says, do you know what, Isaiah? It's been written by I don't know how many different people. It doesn't seem it was all written by one guy called Isaiah. Well, I can stand back now and look at that and say, well, my faith isn't based on who wrote Isaiah. It was based on the claim that Jesus died and was raised back to life. And now... I'm interested in understanding it for what it is. God's just providentially had handed to me the word, his word in this book. It's not for me to question how he had it written, composed, received. I just trust that this is what it is. Do you see how that overcomes for me a, what I think is a brittle approach or understanding of scriptures? They just fall apart because that assumes wrongly that the reason I trust this Bible is that it comes up to my own expectations for how it should be written. We're going, to, we're going to talk a bit more about that at the next point. So search for the truth, second point, is it's important to remember, one, it's reasonable to think that texts outside of science can make truth claims that are reliable. Second, that it's important to remember, this is the basis for a providential view of Scripture, that that my trust and the reason why I privilege the Bible as a source for truth is based on my own belief in the resurrection, essentially. The third one is that, can I see the time, please, Paul? So I'm not... No, just one, half past seven. Half past seven. The third one is that once we're now thinking, hey, I'm, I'm being consistent with how we live our daily lives in actually accessing truth from something other than the chemistry textbook. So I've, my search has extended, well, has now gone beyond science. Two, that I can now understand that my interest in this text comes to me as a result of my faith in Christ, his death and resurrection. Then third, when I then look at the Bible in my search for truth, that I have to approach it and wrestle with its humanity. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Ooh. Now, <coughs> by wrestling with the humanity of Scripture, I've already sort of touched on when I say, hey, what if Isaiah is written by a whole lot of different people and now it's come to us and it just looks like it's called the book of Isaiah, but there's plenty of people have their hand in it. And I think, well, I've just got to trust that God 
has handed me the book of Isaiah I need and that it makes the appropriate truth claims for me to live a fulfilling life under his, his reign, right? So, um, in a sense, when we talk about wrestling with the Bible's humanity, we should expect that the text we come across will reflect what we do as humans. We edit the Bible, we edit texts. These days, if you're writing something in Word, you're always going back and changing it. You move it to someone else, and you check this, they'll go and write things in and so on. So it's, that's a very human thing to do. But what I mean by the humanity of the Bible is actually that it reflects how we understand the person of Christ. So if you think of Jesus, you think of him as fully divine, right? So he is God, fully God, nothing missing from his godness. But he's also fully human. Now, so what does this mean? It, it would mean that if we turned up to a party in Nazareth, and uh, you go, and this is now back in the first century, you would say, hey, I, you know, I've gone to a party, and you'll say, hey, I ran into a guy tonight, and his name was Jesus, right? Think, oh, I just met Jesus. Um, the only way that you would have understood Jesus for one of us would have been if we'd learned, at least it seemed Aramaic, they think, so you've got to speak his language. Um, you would have had to have understood the rules of the kind of humour. So, so they're probably very different from our mainline humour in Australia, right? Um, you would have had to have understood that he had certain purity rules that were, were the Jewish purity rules. So you had to be very careful what you offered him. You know, you don't go offering him a prawn or something like this. And so you have to attend to his humanity. And yet some people, when they met him at the party, went home and said, oh yeah, I just met a guy called Jesus of Nazareth, funny guy, because they understood all those rules. Someone else went away and said, I just met the Word of God, see? And so there's a sense in which to meet the Word of God in Jesus, so what John says, was you have to attend completely to his humanity to get to him if you met him face to face. Do you know what I'm saying here? So, so you had to know his language, you had to know his customs. Um, there, there are all these rules to get into him, to attend to his humanity. So he's called the Word of God, and so is Scripture. And so Scripture, to, to attend to it well in our search for truth, has to be to attend to its humanity. It is fully divine. We believe it's the Word of God. Yet, just like meeting Jesus at that party, knowing language, customs, and so on, to access the Word of God, the divinity of Scripture, is to attend to the humanity of Scripture. It's fully human. So in a sense, we never expect to open the Bible and see some glowing part that's supernatural. It is fully human, right? So I want to look at this in terms of Genesis 1, how, how this may work. I think overarching, the big significance of this is, I think this is important for how we read Scripture as Christians or the Bible as Christians, is because we expect that it's fully human, not, not sort of floaty human, you know, you know sometimes, were you ever scared as a kid of the idea of heaven that you'll be wearing these white gowns singing uh, in a choir forever? You ever had that fear? Um, and so, so the type of human that comes to mind is something like not a gritty, real human, but just something really boring and, and disturbing. Um, and, and that's not what we think of, we should be thinking of when we think of the biblical authors. They were real guys who were riding the camels or horses or whatever they were on. I keep on trashing them on that. But they were, they were real human beings that had customs and did things the way people then did things with text. And therefore we have to attend to their humanity. It goes further than that. Just as I don't understand myself, I find it very difficult. If I can't understand myself, I struggle to completely understand another person. So it always requires a humility when I approach another human being, if I want to attend to the truth of what they're saying. And that extends to reading the, the, the humanity of Scripture. And you'll, if you're from a Christian background, you'll know this isn't always practice. So there are people ready to slaughter other people because they don't read, in this case, Genesis 1, the way that they read it. And so there's almost an arrogance. What we'd say is almost an inter interpretive violence of just having your way with that text. That, that's what it's like. So when we come to this text, it's with humility 
and asking questions as you would of any other human when we're reading, even though we believe it's fully divine, fully human. Now, what I'd say as we come to Genesis 1, is there are a few things we notice about its humanity. There's one, it's written in Hebrew, and I showed you that before, the scribbles uh, on the page. It's written in Hebrew, so to attend the humanity of this text requires an understanding of Hebrew, if you really want to understand what it's saying. Um, the second thing is going to come down to genre. And genre is the style of literature. So the classic example is the newspaper style. And you can recognise it a long way away. So you recognise the Australian newspaper, but then you could, you could see a newspaper that's written in Arabic and yet no English there, but you recognise it straight away as the genre of newspaper. Um, we're very... You know, it's like picking out faces in a crowd. You know, it's amazing how if there's a sea of faces, and when you think, in actual fact, is a tiny, the face that you recognise at times, if you actually think how much of the picture I'm looking at is that face, a tiny little thing, some of our, how our brains, can, that facial recognition is so sharp, right? And it's the same with genre. So you look at kids reading The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, you don't end up having a kid who's got a problem walking into the back of a wardrobe thinking, hang on, Aren't they supposed to have something where I can just walk through into another? We, we somehow pick up that that genre is, is not telling us history as it happened. It's another kind of literature. It's the same with Genesis 1. We've got to think about what kind of genre is it. If we attend to that, and we look at the Old Testament and think, well, what was happening? This is a few thousand years ago. Something like this was written. It comes before the scientific method. Um, it's unlikely that it belongs to the genre of scientific method, but, but we find that in the ancient world there were other genres of creation story. When you get them in uh, indigenous creation stories in this country, but the classic is one called the Numa Elish, which starts when the gods were on high, and it just goes on to talk about um, the gods, there's plenty of gods there, and they're making humans to look after them and to dig ditches for water and to feed them with sacrifices. And so there is something called the genre of creation story. And you think, right, Genesis 1 is somewhere near creation story. So in the beginning, not when the gods were on high, but it's now in the beginning this chapter starts. The next thing we could attend to in this chapter, and I'm going to read a little bit in a moment, is cultural context. Sometimes we get so familiar with the text of the Bible, it probably is almost getting familiar with a person and thinking that we know them. So Genesis 1 is a text like that. We can have thoughts of, and sometimes we'll talk about humans being made in the image of God. The image, therefore, is this perfect person, uh, ethically pure um, almost a person again, like the person in the white robe singing in a choir in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, but actually, if you attend to what's said in Genesis 1, we're dealing with a Jewish person that's on view. And what I have in mind is first, the Sabbath rest, right? When you get to the end of the days, verse 1 of chapter 2, thus the heavens and the earth were finished or completed and all their multitude and on the seventh day, God finished the work he'd done, and he rested on the seventh day, which sounds very much near you've got Sabbath, but it's Shabbat when he rests. Um, so there's that word play there from all the work that he'd done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all the work that he'd done in creation. Now, anyone who knows the rest of the Old Testament knows the Jews rested on every seventh day, right? So it makes sense for a Jewish reader here. They see something of themselves. The other classic is on day four, where God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. When it says lights, it literally says, let there be candle lights, which is an odd thing to write in a text about creation. Let there be candle lights in the skies, and let them be for signs of proclamations, but it's actually Israel's calendar it's speaking about here. If you go up to the back half of Leviticus, you'll find this. So it keeps talking about there being Israel's 
tab, it's essentially Israel's, it's their tabernacle, does everyone know what a tabernacle? Their tent's candle that had seven lights on it. Um, I, I always like saying the seven lights, and this is where seven comes from in the ancient world, I think, is from Israel's, the solar lunar calendar used in the ancient world was based on being able to see the sun, moon, and five planets in our solar system with the naked eye. So seven became very significant for, for order, speaking about the order of the world uh, around them. And this is particularly important for, for Israel. I think that's why it's here. And here you've got candlelight. So I'd say cultural context, what sort of cultural ideas do we have in this text? Well, it's very much about Israel, it's Jewish, Jewish culture. I mean, it's written in Hebrew. We've got a reference to candles there in the sky rather than the sun and moon. Um, and we've got a reference to the Sabbath. So this is starting to form our thinking about the humanity. So we're attending to the Hebrew that's written there. The genre, it's very important, it seems, to attend to this text. You know, you shouldn't just read any one text on its own. It's usually humans, because we think of what humans do, rarely do they pull something out of nothing and say, hey, here is the first ever creation story. It usually is something based on the shoulders of somebody else. Do you know what I mean? So when, when I was in the UK, they took John Milton's Paradise Lost out of the really posh public school system because they thought, hang on, um, the, the students have been have, have, are so far removed from, a, from an, any understanding of the Bible that they're never going to be able to read this text well. Um, Paradise Lost is riffing on the Old Testament, particularly Genesis. And uh, so they thought they'd give them Harry Potter or something like that to read instead. So, so um, it's very important when we're reading to keep looking at what else is there that forms the context here, you see. So then we've got this Jewish thing, and we're going to bring all this together when I talk about what is the truth claim of Genesis 1. The next thing we want to look at, so I'll get rid of this, the next thing to look at is then the structure of what's going on. Because we've got to say, you know, it's only, uh, it's only worth asking the questions that the text keeps yielding answers to. It's like if the, the cops take someone and put them in a cell and ask, start asking them questions, it's, it's a pointless line of questioning if the person doesn't even have any answers to that kind of thing. They've got to dig around and say, well, what can you answer? And, and this is going to come up with the days, when we ask questions about the days. If you think of the structure of this text, and there may be some people who are not, I'm sorry if you're not really familiar with this text, I'll try to do as much as I can to paint the outline. It starts, remember, in, in, the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, now, everything's formless and empty, right? Formless. Form, what's spelling? Formless and empty. So this is the beginning. Verses 1, 2. So some people like to think of this as chaos, disorder. This is how we start. And then you remember how we finish, right? It's rest, order. And in between, you've then got these six days. So this is day seven. Now, you could try right reading them linearly. So you'll say, day one, does anyone remember exactly what happens? Come on, Paul. Day one, what does he make? Light and darkness. Light, darkness. Okay, day two. Calm down. Where are you? Sky and sea. Oh, and sky, <laughs> dry land. Okay, dry land. Yeah, three, dry land. Sea and dry land, was it? No. Three, no. Okay, three is dry land and there. Three is dry land. Dry land, vegetation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it goes, what does it go? Evening, morning? Yeah. Evening, morning. Evening, morning. Evening, morning. Okay, day four, what does he make? Sun and, Sun and moon. Okay, we don't really need to go much further than that because that creates us a problem if we're asking questions about the lineal 
reading of the text, right? Because we're going, there was evening, morning, and flying, sunset, sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset, sunrise, and then all of a sudden the sun and moon turn up. So you're sort of thinking, right. Now, if we're, if, this is where interpretive violence can come in. You think, darn it, I will have my way with this text, right? You could say, okay, the way I'm going to have the way for this text is I'm going to introduce another meaning for light. God is light. Therefore, there can be evening and morning on days one to three, and then finally he puts those candles up in the sky, which is also starting to sound weird, but who knows, we won't even bother answering that question. And you can say the line of questioning is a fruitless line of questioning. It just it ends up in special pleading. So we can do something else and think, right, this human who's written this text is trying to do something else with me now. I can see what's going on. We're sort of more in an art gallery. And we've got to think about some think about things in a different way. So if you looked at that, and if I told you vegetation in the ancient world is regarded as part of the natural hardware, it's not viewed as a living being or anything like that, what would you say? It's, it's structures, right? There's light, there's dark, there's sky. It even talks about sort of a pan or something being used to hold up the waters in the sky. And then there's, there's, there's sea. Sorry, that's sky and land, right? Sky and sea. Two. Sorry, sky and sea, yes, because before there's dry land. Then there's, there's dry land, and there we go. Then we go day four, day five, day six. How does it work if we bring these alongside here? What happens on day four? He fills the sky with lights. Right? Well, why am I bothering this? <laughs> Lights in the sky, so heavenly bodies we may call them, the planets. Then we've got the fish, birds, etc., swarming things. Here, now we've got beasts and humans, which are like the pinnacle of the creation. Notice we can run ahead here and say the humans are every human. I'd argue it's talking about Israelites. It's talking about the ideal human in Genesis 1 is not every human, I believe, and people here may argue against me, we have in mind a very Israelite human. So when they're told to rule and have dominion, you see what they do in Joshua. But I think it's, uh, that, that, that I'm going out on a limb there and I may be wrong. But now when we look at this, we say, hey, we're formless and empty, disorder, then we see, okay, so I said the days one to seven is a common uh, organize. it's a common number used in the Old Testament to speak of order. So you think, well, generally the chapter is about order, but look look at how it balances days one, two, three with structures and then fills them on days four, five, six. And he brings about order where there's rest, peace, and God enjoying his creation. And now by Standing back and attending to this, I mean, notice, notice that this structure, or this text, nothing is said about the dating, right? So if you go back to Genesis 1, you think, well, where did it sit within the history of the world? There's nothing to date it or say who wrote it. It's like a free-floating text that happens to be on the front of the Bible, but could, I think, be inserted anywhere, you know, after Psalms or in the middle of Isaiah. It's its own text. Now, what I would suggest to you, and this is one of the wonderful things about finding truth outside of science, I said it's delicious, is because you end up having very little certainty in the end that you really got it. But it's enjoyable wrestling over it with other people. Ultimately, I'd argue that this text was written possibly, possibly late in Israel's history, right? Possibly after they've experienced... Uh, their escape from Egypt in Exodus, possibly after the Assyrians have destroyed the north, uh, if you go and read 1, 2 Kings, uh, possibly even after the Babylonian exile, and now it's all over and they've come back to the land uh, under, the per under Persian rule. And what if, what we've got here, if we think about well, what would humans do, that those in power say, hey, We've seen that every time there was disorder introduced into the life of Israel, 
every time they tried to kill our kids, every time they gave us hard work, every time they stole us away from the land, every time we were oppressed and they robbed us away from even thinking that God was in control, we have experienced that the God that we trust is a God who imposes and introduces order where there's chaos. Do you see what I mean? That, that, this is the hymnic overture for the rest of the Bible when you read it. Here is the resounding truth claim that we're going to make. Is God, it says something about what God's like, he brings order where there's disorder, and that he is committed to Israel. At this point, I don't think it's even talking about every human, he's committed to Israel. Now, later in the Old Testament, it does talk about Israel then bringing uh, completion to the rest of creation, which they failed to do, and that's why there's one true Israelite who comes through the other side, who is Christ, Jesus Christ. But you see what I've done? So on the, on the third point, search for truth is to wrestle with the humanity of Scripture. It's an enjoyable wrestle that we would have in trying to understand any other human being, that we approach with humility and we ask questions so that when, when we do feel a bit disturbed, it's sort of like trusting your best friend. Hey, I've just heard something about my best friend that sort of casts him in a pretty poor light. But he's my best friend and it doesn't seem to gel with what I generally think about him. So probably the approach I'll take is just to sit him down and ask a few questions and I might just find out there was another way of looking at this. Um, I'm feeling really hot here now. There's no air conditioning, is there? Mm. Can pop it on if you want. Anyway, that's where I'm going to pull up. I'm hoping that you follow those steps that I use um, when I think, you know, what do I think about the truth claims of the Bible? Am I like the person who saw the UFO or not? Um.